What a day that will be. There is coming a day when the heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there. No more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one that saved me by his grace. For oh, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day, glorious day. Amen. Good evening. Shall we look to the Lord in prayer? Our God and our Father, we are so humbled as we think of this great gift of love that you gave your only begotten Son, the Son of your love, for sinners such as myself and all those in the world, that we might be redeemed and have a place with you and with him in the glory. Thank you, Father, and help us now as we open your word in Christ's name. Amen. Well, what a blessing to have the Word of God. And uh, we're going to look in Luke chapter 7 tonight. Luke 7, verse 1. Now, when he had ended all his sayings, talking about the Lord Jesus, in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. So Capernaum uh, becomes the headquarters, uh, as it were, for the Lord Jesus. It's a city on the, the north side of the Sea of Galilee in Israel. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. You know, uh, I'm a farmer and uh, I've had or I have uh, employees that have worked for me, uh, one over 30 years, others 20 years. And, and uh, you, you know, we're friends and uh, like family. And I can understand this centurion when he had a, a servant, uh, you know, we for us it's employees, but someone that... Uh, had been close to him and had served and worked for him, and and he's sick. He's very concerned, uh, and uh, it says that he was dear unto him. So that's a a wonderful thing. And this servant was most probably a Jew, and it might be uh, the reason that this centurion centurion is a Roman soldier, a centurion. Uh, he had a hundred soldiers under him, just like we have the word century, meaning a hundred. So uh, he had a hundred soldiers under him. And uh, this uh, servant, perhaps if he was a Jew, told him about the things of God. Because the Romans were idolatrous. They didn't know God. and uh, But the Jews did. Uh, now, we should understand about the Jews. Though they had the word of God, and though they believed in the one God of Israel, the creator of heaven and earth, they were disobedient to God. And that's why John the Baptist, when you read in the beginning of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that uh, when John the Baptist came, he preached a message of repentance because the people of Israel were not right with God. And the Lord Jesus continued to preach that message and uh, to open the door of salvation so that they could understand what God really wanted of them and, uh, uh, and how they could be right with God. 
not by keeping the law, which they had, Ten Commandments, which they had all had broken, but by simple faith in him. And we're going to see this kind of faith in this centurion. So the centurion in verse uh, 3, when he heard of Jesus, uh, I just want to stop and think about that. This is why it's so important to preach the gospel. So many people, particularly even in our society, the United States of America, don't know about Jesus. Oh, they might have heard his name, undoubtedly used as a cuss word, but they don't know who he is, that he's the very God of heaven and earth that became a man. They don't know uh, about him because they don't believe the Bible, so they don't read it. So this centurion, he had heard about Jesus. Perhaps he uh, obviously heard about his miracles. Perhaps he had uh, heard about what he taught, but uh, he was persuaded that the Lord Jesus could help him. And we need to be persuaded in whatever situation we're in, the Lord Jesus can help us. Hallelujah. And really, he's the only one that can. And so it says, when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. So you see how this was a Gentile, a Roman. He was a Gentile. So he is uh, distinguished from the Jews, meaning that Jews and Gentiles. A Gentile is simply someone that's not a Jew. Uh, he was not a part of their bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he was not a part of their religion. Uh, so he was a Gentile, but he had heard, and perhaps through his servant, of the God of Israel, the maker of heaven and earth. And uh, so uh, he had relations with these Jews. And instead of him going to the Lord Jesus, because remember, he's a Roman. He could have gone to uh, the Lord Jesus just as a Jew that was under him, this conquered nation, and, and uh, told him to come and to heal his servant. Oh, he didn't do that. Instead, he sent the, Jew, the elders of the Jews to go and bring Jesus uh, to him. And uh, this just shows that this man uh, had a, a sense of what's right in God's sight. Uh, he was a humble man. Even though he had a high position uh, as a soldier, he was a humble man. And so the Jews, it says in verse um, 4, when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this, for he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. The synagogue was simply a meeting place for the Jews. So why did these elders of the Jews... These men that are out of the will of God, uh, these men that have been called to repent by John the Baptist and by Jesus himself, uh, why is it that they would uh, act as mediators for a Gentile, a Roman, who had conquered their nation and who they were subservient to, why would they do anything for him? Well, because this centurion loved the nation Israel and built them a synagogue. In other words, these men uh, felt that uh, to be right with God, you had to be right with them, with the people of Israel. And uh, there, there's many people that think that way today, that if you want to be right with God, you have to be right with our religion. You have to be right with uh, uh, the leadership uh, that we have. You have to believe what we believe. And they leave God entirely out of it. Because the, the first and foremost thing God wants is he wants our hearts and our souls to be before him. You know, if we're without Christ tonight, if one of you was without Christ, God wants you to know that he loves you and that you need to repent of your sins and turn to Christ as your Lord and Savior. You need to go directly to God through Christ. It has nothing to do with going to a preacher like these uh, uh, Jews who were elders felt that if you wanted to come to God, that they were the ones that you could go to and, and uh, they could mediate for you. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is religious nonsense. God wants a direct line between you and I and him. After all, when we sin, we sin directly against God. So we should go directly to him to, uh, to repent and to ask for forgiveness. And that's why Christ came to the world, so we could do that. Praise his name. And so these, uh, these Jewish men, they felt that this centurion was worthy of the Lord's help 
because this centurion had helped the Jews. Well, the Lord, he's no respecter of persons. He doesn't care what nationality someone is. Uh, he, he, he's not going to help this centurion servant because uh, the centurion has done something for Israel. No, that's not the way God looks upon men. We're all uh, sinners. We, we all need God's grace, and none of us is any higher, uh, more esteemed, valued in the sight of God than the other. And I'd just like to make a comment about this centurion who was helping the Jews. Uh, it was very right that he should help the Jews. I mean, at that day, their religion was the religion of God, even though they were being disobedient. But today, things have changed. And uh, we have the New Testament. Christ has come. He's died. He's been buried. He's risen. And he has ascended back into the glory. And so we uh, preach the good news of Jesus Christ. The Jews who crucified Christ because they didn't believe in him still do not believe in him as a nation. There's a small group of Jews, a very small number, called the Messianic Jews, meaning they've received the Messiah, and they're Christians. But there's very few. The nation as a whole in the Middle East, that nation is an unbelieving nation. And Paul even said in the book of Romans, 11th chapter, the 28th verse, he says, as concerning the gospel... The Jews are enemies for your sakes, meaning that because they have rejected Christ and the gospel, now the gospel has gone out to the Gentiles, and, and now the church has become the testimony for God. But as touching election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. In other words, this people is still chosen, God's chosen people, and he will finish his work with them when the Lord Jesus, after he takes the church to heaven in the rapture, will come and deal with Israel. And they will, not the whole nation, but a remnant, will accept him, believe in him, and they will be the true Israel of God. The, the, the Israel that uh, God always wanted, uh, the, uh, the Israel that would believe in him, yield to him, and submit to the Lord Jesus as Messiah. I say that because there's many Christians that think there's special merit in uh, helping Israel. Well, uh, you know, the Bible says to do good unto all men, especially them that are uh, of the household of faith. But Paul says in uh, Romans chapter 15 and verse 25, he says, But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. So he was, in, he was uh, uh, going back to Jerusalem to minister to who? The Jews? No, the saints. And then he says, For it has pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints, which are at Jerusalem. The poor saints. He was carrying monies for the poor saints at Jerusalem. So I would say, just as that scripture said in, in Galatians 6.10, as you have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Uh, believing Jews qualify as saints and as the household of faith. We should help them first. And then as Israel as a whole, we should help all men. Uh, you know, whether they're uh, those that are warring against Israel or Israel itself. We're to do good to all men. And uh, we're not to take sides and uh, choose uh, Israel over other people. Because if Israel is unbelieving and other people are unbelieving, how, how is there more merit in being a Jew? I think there's more accountability and a greater judgment uh, uh, upon that people because they have the opportunity of receiving Jesus as Messiah, as the whole world does, but they have uh, were given the word of God from the beginning. I just wanted to say that in relation to this centurion. And so, uh, in, in verse 6, then Jesus went with them. Now, I just want to make a comment here. So we've mentioned Jews and Gentiles. And the Jews were given the Bible. Uh, in Romans uh, chapter 3, uh, verses 1 and 2, it talks about uh, that uh, what prophets uh, being a Jew or being one of the circumcision, it says much in every way, chiefly because they, they had the oracles of God. They had the word of God. So the Jews, they had the word of God. It was given to them and they were responsible for keeping the word of God, uh, 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 making copies of it and keeping it pure. 
but they did not obey it. Though they had the word of God, they did not obey it. And we read in Romans chapter 2, 24, that the name, uh, Paul said, the name of God is blasphemed, blasphemed uh, among the Gentiles because of you. You see, the Jews were to be a, uh, an example and a testimony to the Gentiles because they uh, had the God of the Bible. They knew him, but they were hypocrites. And this is exactly what we want to pay close attention to. Uh, there are so many people, and I don't want to be part of them. And, and, and if the God would show me some area in my life that's not right, then I will repent of it. But we don't want to be hypocrites. And that's what the Jews were. They were claiming a false position before God when really they were more uh, uh, guilty than the Gentiles. The Gentiles didn't know God. They didn't have the word of God, but the Jews did. And yet they disobeyed God. They went into idolatry themselves. And so here are these, you know, Jewish people in Jerusalem, you know, uh, they've got the temple and they think that as long as they have a temple uh, that they're right with God, but really the temple was empty. You, know, you read in the Old Testament that God used to dwell within the temple. His Shekinah glory was there. But in the book of Ezekiel, because of the disobedience of Israel, God's glory left. So the Jews at this time, they had a temple, but it was empty. And that's the problem with many people, their religion. Uh, they, they have all of these thoughts about God, but ultimately God is not there. And we want to be sure that we're not a part of some religious system uh, that teaches about God, but does not enjoy the very presence of God. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered unto my name, there am I in the midst of them. It's the name of Jesus that is so significant. It's the person of the Lord Jesus, the very Son of God, God who became a man. That is the significance of people are to gather around him. And as we gather around the word of God tonight, we gather around the person of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus, to him be glory both now and forevermore. And so there was a division between the Jews and the Gentiles. And in Acts chapter 10, Peter was called to go to a man's house named Cornelius, who was a Gentile. And Peter wouldn't have gone because unless God had spoke to him in a vision, telling him that God is no respecter of persons. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, it doesn't matter to God, you're all, we're all sinners. And so Peter then went to Cornelius' house to preach. But he, was, he wouldn't have gone otherwise because in his mind, uh, uh, as a Jew, you were not to keep company with Gentiles. This is a prejudice that uh, is a religious prejudice. And it's terrible. All kinds of prejudice is terrible because, you know, all of us came from Adam and Eve, right? We all are part of the same family of men. It doesn't matter the color of our skin or language, whether we're rich or poor. It doesn't matter. And we're all sinners. So Christ Jesus, he came to the world to save sinners. It doesn't matter if you find him in India, Africa, South America, or in, you know, El Centro, uh, California, Brawley, California. He came to the world to save sinners. Praise his name. So now these uh, 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 elders of the Jews have got the Lord Jesus, and they're heading back to this man's house. And verse 6, when he was now come, but when he is not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not yourself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. And this centurion understood that the Lord Jesus was someone who had great authority, great power, and that the centurion was not even worthy that the Lord should come to his house. So this man is a is a, a humble man, a man who is uh, repenting uh, of of uh, the life of pride and arrogance that so many men live. And he goes on and he says, "Wherefore, verse seven, wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee." So that's why he sent the elders. He didn't think he was even worthy to approach the Lord Jesus. Now think about this. I want to say it again. He's a Gentile. He's a Roman. They have conquered the Jews. They've conquered Israel. 
it, it, he could have very easily had the mentality of all the other Romans, and that is that the Jews were just a conquered people and uh, that they were to be under the Roman's foot, but not this man. No, this man, this is why I think that his servant had been a Jew. This man had been taught that God is God Almighty, that God is one that we are to be humbled in front of. And he saw the Lord Jesus as God's representative. He didn't know everything about him, of course, but he knew he was God's representative because he was doing these miracles. And that's why he wanted the Lord Jesus to come so he could heal his servant. And so he says in verse 7 to the uh, through these um, uh, messengers to the Lord Jesus, he says, but say in a word and my servant will be healed. He says, Lord, you don't have to come to my house. I'm not worthy of you coming. But all you have to do is speak the word. And I know that you can heal my servant. Imagine that. He believed that the power of the Lord Jesus was so great that he could just speak a word. Now, I want you to see verse 8. This is so great. This man learned a lesson from his own life and he applies it spiritually. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. You see, this man had a small, you know, he had a hundred soldiers under him. He had a sphere of, of authority and influence. And when he made a command, uh, men obeyed him. But he sees the Lord Jesus as a, someone who is far, far, far greater than himself. And all the Lord has to do, that he has authority to speak. And uh, I don't know if the man thought the angels of heaven would be the uh, messengers or what, but he knew the Lord had a power to speak and his servant would be healed. Now, this is great faith. And that's what the Lord says in the next verse. Verse 9, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. So here was a, a prepared people, Israel. They had the word of God, but they had no faith. And here's a Gentile that, that understood uh, that the God of the Bible, the God of uh, Israel was the true God. He humbled himself. He saw the Lord Jesus as one that was far, far more worthy than himself. In fact, he saw himself as not worthy at all. And I just want you to see this, that you and I are not worthy for God's blessing. We're not worthy that he should come to our house. We're not worthy that he should, that he should come to our life. We're not worthy that he should do anything for us. I mean, who are we? We've sinned against him. We, we've rebelled in, in our lives of, of disobedience against God, against God. What God owes us nothing. He owes us nothing. And yet people will continually pray to God. And if he doesn't answer their prayers, even though they're out of his will, they've never called upon God and they're only doing it now because they have a problem, that, that they call upon God. And if he doesn't do what they want, if prayers aren't answered just the way they want, then they'll curse God. They'll turn their back on God even again. That They'll look down upon God because they'll say things like, well, I tried God, but it didn't work for me. I tried God, but he wouldn't listen to me. Oh, my, that, that, what kind of twisted thinking is that? Here you're living in a sinful way, disobeying Almighty God, and then you think you can just snap your fingers and he's going to bring blessing in your life? This centurion, he understood. He did not deserve a blessing. You need to understand that tonight. If you want to be saved, you'll be saved by grace. 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 That means that you don't deserve a blessing. I don't deserve a blessing. I don't deserve that my sins should be forgiven. I don't deserve the Son of God should come into the world to die for me. I don't deserve that. I de deserve, if you want to talk about what we deserve, I deserve eternal judgment. The damnation of hell after the way I lived without Christ. But God had mercy upon me. God was gracious unto me. I am unworthy. It did not have to do with me doing something to please God, to, to lift myself up in his eyes. It has everything to do with what Jesus Christ did at the cross of Calvary. It's because he died for me as my substitute 
that I can be identified with him in the sight of God with the resurrected Christ, and God accepts me because of Jesus, because of what Jesus has done for me. And that's the same way he'll accept you tonight. If you're unsaved, don't uh, think that you deserve a blessing. Don't be praying to God to heal your mom, get you out of jail, you know, fix this problem or that problem. No, don't pray to God for a blessing. You don't deserve it. Pray to God for forgiveness. Repent and uh, uh, confess to God that you're unworthy of the least of his mercies. Then you can begin a relationship with him. And then you can understand what it is to pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Because now your heart will be changed and your mind will be uh, uh, changed as well. And you become more, more like God as you read the Bible and you understand his will and you submit to him. And then you can pray intelligently because then you'll be on God's side because Jesus Christ will be your Lord and your Savior. Hallelujah. So uh, let's just close in prayer. Our God, we thank you today for our Lord Jesus. We thank you that he is the Messiah, not only of Israel, but he is the Savior of the world. Hallelujah. And we want to, just as we said, we want to be like that centurion. We don't deserve a blessing. We don't deserve the forgiveness of our sins or eternal life. We don't deserve the food on our table. We don't deserve our health. We don't deserve anything good. But you have been good to us. Hallelujah. And we thank you now for your mercies. And if there's someone listening, Lord, that, that has never received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, may they do it now. That they might see that Jesus Christ is the worthy one. And all we are is sinners. And when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then in God's sight, we are identified with the Lord Jesus and we are accepted, accepted by God through the person of Christ. Hallelujah. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.